Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jens Kod, who will talk about the quantum Gromov Hausdorff continuity of quantum SU2. Take it away. Thanks a lot. Um, and thanks, Karen, for this invitation. Um, it's it's really great to have this opportunity to speak in this uh, NCT and uh, T seminar in uh, Prague. I'm um, on sabbatical in Dresden from my home university, University of Southern Denmark. So it's really not far away to go to Prague. So this is great. Um, I'm going to talk about um, quantum issue two today. Um, and this talk is based on uh, joint work with my colleague, colleague uh, David Kuhl, who's also at the University of Southern Denmark. And what we have been doing is that we have been studying the uh, spectral uh, metric properties of uh, quantum issue two. And this has, um, this study has uh, two components. So first of all, we have been uh, showing that quantum issue two is indeed a spectral metric space. Um, so what does this mean? Um, it means that it's a, a, a compact quantum metric space in the sense of Riefel, and moreover that this uh, structure is uh, geometric. And in this case, uh, it comes from the uh, pairing between the quantum enveloping algebra uh, for quantum issue two and the cornered algebra for quantum issue two. Um, and the second component that we have been investigating is um, well, how does quantum issue two as a spectral metric space change when you vary the deformation parameter Q? And the correct way of, of, uh, of measuring these continuity properties or the way that we are interested in is to use the uh, quantum core of Hausdorff uh, distance, which was also invented by uh, Mark Riefel. So this is... Um, very short introduction to this talk and then um, I will now get started for real with some um, background information on uh, quantum issue two. I should say also that in this continuity result we actually uh, also include the classical case where q equals one and when q equals one uh, we recover the uh, three sphere with the round metric so Okay, so I will present some background material on quantum issue two um, to begin with. So um, we start by fixing the uh, deformation parameter Q. I will only consider Q between uh, zero and one and uh, zero is not an option, but one is an option. Okay, and then uh, we define this coordinate algebra Quantum algebra for quantum issue two. This is a universal unital star algebra. Universal unital star algebra, and it has uh, two generators. As a star algebra, A and B, and they satisfy uh, relations which can be summarized very quickly by saying that a certain two times two matrix is unitary. So that's that U here, which has, um, okay, so slightly strange conventions, but that's how it is. So you have A star and B star in the first column, and then you have minus Q, B and A in the second column. And uh, this matrix has to be unitary. Unitary, um, so uh, U star U is the identity. Oops. So it's U times U star, and this unitary is called the fundamental unitary. Okay. Um, this quantum algebra is also a um, a Hopf star algebra. And so it has a co-product. Uh, 
delta and you can just see what the coproduct does to this fundamental unitary. Um, so if I apply it to U, I get U tensor U, but this has to be interpreted correctly. Okay, there's also um, there's an anti -pod. So when I apply, apply the anti -pod to U, this means I apply the anti -pod entry by entry here. I get um, just the adjoint of U, and finally the co-unit. When I apply the co-unit to U, I'll just get the identity matrix. Okay. Um, I'm also interested in analyzing quantum issue two from a C star algebraic perspective. Um, so I'll define the C star algebraic version of quantum issue two. So there are essentially two ways of, of uh, doing this. Um, and I will use one which is the most concrete um, where I apply the uh, Haas state. So it's a little theory. Okay, I have um, a unique Linear map H defined on the cornered algebra and with values inside the complex numbers such that it satisfies uh, two properties. Well, when I apply it to the unit, I'll get the unit, and moreover, it's uh, invariant. So it's invariant. So this means that if I uh, look at the, the product applied to some element in the cornered algebra, and then I slice it with the identity tensor uh, H, then I get nothing but uh, H applied to X multiplied with the unit. And the same happens if I slice with H on the, on the different leg here. Okay, and this um, this linear map is called the uh, Haas state. You can actually compute it explicitly uh, if you want to. Um, now, using this Haas state, I can form a uh, Hilbert space. I can I can define an inner product. So. If I take the inner product of X and Y inside the cornered algebra, I, I just apply the Haas state to the adjoint of X times Y. And then I can look at uh, the Hilbert space completion. Completion. It's called L2 of SUQ2. So this is Hilbert space and the cornered algebra uh, for quantum issue two, it acts on this Hilbert space uh, via lift multiplication. So I have actually a unital objective homomorphism and on this cornered algebra and into the uh, bounded operators on this Hilbert space. And this is via lift multiplication. Um, so I can use this uh, star homomorphism, this representation to define a, a C star norm. So I have now C star norm by right, so an element X. This will just be the operator norm of pi of X. So pi of x is a bounded operator on this Hilbert space, so I can apply the operator norm. Um, and the C star completion is then a, um, 
C style algebraic uh, compact quantum group. So that's a quantum issue two. And um, I'm really interested in the uh, metric properties of uh, quantum issue two. And the framework that I'm going to apply is uh, Riefel's um, notion of uh, compact quantum metric spaces. And for this, uh, I will need to introduce a, a semi norm on this uh, cornered algebra. And uh, I would like this semi-norm to be uh, geometric in some sense. Uh, for me, or during this talk, this will mean that it comes from the uh, pairing between the quantum enveloping algebra and the cornered algebra for uh, quantum issue two. Um, I'm not going to spend time on introducing this quantum enveloping algebra, but I will show you a couple of twisted derivations acting on uh, quantum issue two. And then I will just try to convince you that these do indeed come from the quantum enveloping algebra. So how does it go? Uh, yeah, yeah. H of u zero? H of u is uh, zero, yes. Yes, H of u is zero. Yeah. That's right. So if you use the co-representation unitaries, it vanishes on all of them, except on the unit. There's also a question in the chat. Yeah. Is the pairing giving you the polynomial, then you can completion the unitary function? Uh, this is perhaps a little bit vague as a question. Um, I mean, usually the pairing will only give you like, first order operators because they're vector fields uh, in the classical case. So you will not get C infinity functions, I think. Um, yes. Excuse me, like... I have a question. Sorry. I'm listening, yes. but maybe. So the pairing with universal enveloping is uh, allowing you to get the polynomials and then you take C infinity uh, like a completion of these polynomials, you know, for sure norm with that. Is that what you're doing? I'm, I'm actually not going to consider C infinity functions in this talk, but okay. yeah, I, I'm, for this talk, I'll only consider the, the polynomial algebra and the C star algebra. Um, oh, okay, okay, thank but, you. You yeah. mentioned the, the completion, that's why I was asking. Yes, so there I was talking about the C star completion. Oh, I am sorry about that. Okay, sorry. Yes, okay. So, thank you. So there will be no C infinity functions oh, in this okay. talk. Sorry it's only going this. to be. No, no, okay. fine, fine. Okay, thank you. okay. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's see how these twisted derivations, what they will look like. I'm, yeah, okay, I'm going to use this. Okay, so I could start out with um, just defining an uh, algebra automorphism. So that's an algebra automorphism. Which we'll call sigma L. So that's going to be an algebra automorphism of the cornered algebra. And I'm just going to tell you what it does to the uh, fundamental unitary U here. So sigma L of U, I just get U, but multiplied with a two times two matrix uh, from the right. So it's like this, 
I have q to the minus one half in the upper left corner and square root of q in the lower right corner. And this is only an Asgore morphism. It's not that well behaved with respect to the star structure. So um, if I look at sigma L of the adjoint of X, then I get actually um, the inverse applied to X and then the adjoint outside. That's how it goes. It doesn't really respect the, the star. It's only an Asgore morphism. And then I have um, twisted derivations. Okay, so three of them. And they are now linear in the morphisms uh, of the corner the algebra. Okay, um, and they're twisted by this automorphism. So uh, what happens if I look at uh, the Leibniz rule, it's not really satisfied. Um, when I apply one of these derivations to a product, I will get the derivation applied to the first element times the automorphism applied to the other one. And um, then I get the inverse of the automorphism applied to X. And then I twist the derivation applied to Y, not X, sorry. So that twisted derivation and the twist is given by this automorphism. They're also explicit. So um, parcel one, when I apply it to my fundamental unitary entry by entry, this is just given by U. And then I multiply from the right by a two times two matrix, which has square root of Q in the upper right corner. And um, here I also have the second one. If you know this language, then, then, then yes. Yes, this is okay. It's actually in this. I mean, it's left action by e multiplied by square root of q. Yeah, that's it. Okay, but for people who don't know it, then uh, not exactly. Yeah, someone is k, or yeah, yeah, someone is k. Yep. Um, and then okay, this is multiplied with. Q to the minus one half in the lower right corner. So it's Q to the minus one half times F. And the last one is, uh, is going to be um, multiplication also from the right by um, some Q numbers. So it looks like that. These guys come from the following construction. Inside of your universal enveloping algebra of SL2, you have a joint representation, and these guys correspond exactly to a joint representation. So it's I, 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 I think it does come from the universal enveloping algebra. It depends on the definition. Well, um, uh, at least in, the one I know. In universal enveloping algebra, yeah. uh, uh, you can consider, for example, right adjoint action. Yeah, yeah. Then yeah. it will split into uh, reducible representations. Mm -hmm. Among these representations, you will have three dimensional representation that mm -hmm. will correspond to quantized adjoint representation. Mm -hmm. So it will be uh, you action on left from from. Right, I don't remember how it will okay. look like, but it's something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think you are absolutely right. So, okay. but maybe we Thanks. can also yeah, talk I about it so. later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not the fine-tuned talk for uh, people doing Hopf algebras, but <laughs> this is um, yeah. Okay, so I will just tell you what these Q numbers are in case you don't know them. If you know them, just ignore it so um, associated with q you have um, and uh, a real number r there are two cases so you have q to the r minus q to the minus r divided by q minus q inverse when q is different from one and when q is equal to one it's just r 
quickly. And these three twisted derivations, you can put them together into a single derivation, which is also twisted. And this is the one I'm going to be interested in. Okay, so um, then we will define our uh, left Iraq derivation, which is called partial. It's defined on this coordinate algebra, it takes values inside two times two matrices, but the coordinate algebra. how is it defined um you put minus partial three and partial three on the diagonal then you put partial two and partial one away from the diagonal um so this is again a, a twisted derivation with respect to uh, sigma out there um i'm going to apply this this uh, derivation to define a um yeah so the algebra acts diagonally on this um, okay, so I'm going to define a semi norm coming from this derivation. So I get my semi norm. It's called LQ, defined on issue Q2. How is it defined? Well, I take the norm of the derivative of an element. So LQ of X. This is going to be the operator norm applied to the left derived derivative of x. So that's it. And I'm not going to say something. I'm going to say that the uh, metric properties of, of uh, quantum issue, issue two, they're governed by this semi norm here. And we shall see how this statement can make sense. Um, but first of all, I would or maybe discuss a little bit why. Okay, so no questions. So now you're mapping into M2, the two by two matrices over, over quantum SU2. Mm -hmm. So then, sorry, it's probably obvious to an analyst, but what's the norm then? Because the norm was on the C star algebra. That's and then right. The matrices, okay, you're just thinking on the, the matrices in C, so it's obvious. Okay. Uh, it's not matrices in C. These are but the, I, I can also represent, okay, I was a little bit slobby, uh, I, I admit it, but I can also represent these two by two matrices as bounded operators on a direct sum of the Hilbert space with itself. And then I use the operator norm. That's, that's, uh, that's how I do it. But it's an important uh, to stress which, which norm you're actually using here because it matters. Um, okay. Um, Okay, why is this left Dirac derivation special for me? Uh, and I think there are, there are several good reasons for this. Um, but yeah, so the first reason is what I already said. I mean, it comes from this pairing between the uh, quantum algebra for quantum issue UC2 and the quantum enveloping algebra. Um, but there's another good reason, uh, which is that it actually also comes from what is called a uh, twisted uh, modular spectral triple. So this is another sense in which this is geometric. So I will just state that. Okay, so this parcel here comes from twisted. modular spectral triple, whatever this is. <laughs> this is some context where you can do non commutative geometry if you are so inclined. And how do you get it? Um, you get it from taking commutators, twisted commutators with the Dirac operators. using twisted commutators. 
mutators with the Dirac. And the Dirac operator is an unbounded self adjoint operator acting actually on two copies of this Hilbert space I have up there. Okay. Um, and the third reason is perhaps uh, the best reason, at least as far as this talk is concerned, um, because I could also have defined a uh, right Dirac derivation um, using the right action of the quantum enveloping algebra instead. And then you could study the relationship between the, the left and the right Dirac uh, derivation. And um, so how do you do that? You can instead uh, define an algebra automorphism or let's sigma R You use exactly the same formula, except you use multiplication from the left instead of from the right. So now sigma R of U is just the same matrix. You multiply U from the left instead of from the right. Okay. And this is an algebra automorphism again. You extend it to an algebra automorphism. Um, and then you have twisted derivations, three of them. Okay, so this is delta one, delta two, and delta three. And they are now, instead of being twisted by sigma L, they're going to be twisted by sigma R, but it's the same kind of Leibniz rule. Okay, uh, so they are, they are endomorphisms of the coordinate algebra. How are they defined? Well, it's the same formula. Again, I use left multiplication instead of right. So delta one of U. multiply with this square matrix here from the from the left instead of from the right and same happens for the other ones and finally delta three of you you multiply with these q half integers but from the left making it into right action <laughs> Okay, and I can again form this um, right Dirac uh, derivation, call it delta. I use the same formula. Um, okay, so I have now the right. Dirac derivation so delta defined on the coordinate algebra and with values inside two times two matrices over the coordinate algebra. And I use the same formula. Okay, um, now we can study the relationship between this right Dirac derivation and the left Dirac derivation. And um, yeah, so maybe you guys know this, but uh, I haven't been able to find it anywhere. So there's a little theorem on this relationship. Um, so the theorem says that if I apply the left Dirac derivation to an element and I conjugate it by U, then I get exactly the right Dirac derivation uh, applied to X. So that is what happens. Um, and this is, I mean, if you think about it, the left-hand side here, it's not at all clear that it's, uh, it's, uh, it satisfies the same kind of Leibniz rule as the right-hand side. So, yeah, so you, 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 you cannot just check this on you or something like that. You, you have to find out, come up with some different kind of proof. Okay, so this is for all X inside the coordinate algebra. And this has uh, very useful consequences for this uh, semi-norm 
that I'm uh, looking at, namely, uh, let's see, corollary here. I could, if I look at the semi norm applied to an element inside the, the cornered algebra. So now I look at LQ of X. Well, this was by definition the operator norm of the left Dirac derivative of X. Well, but this is the same as the right Dirac derivative up to conjugation by this unitary. So um, it doesn't change this operator norm applied to the left Dirac derivative is the same as the one applied to the right Dirac derivative. And this kind of identity we really use heavily when we uh, start discussing uh, how these quantum metric spaces change when you vary the uh, information parameter Q. So this is a crucial corollary for us. Okay. So this was maybe first part of this talk, which was about uh, quantum issue two. And now comes the second part, which is about uh, compact quantum metric spaces. And yeah. I'm going to zoom out quite a bit, uh, quite a bit, and then give a little bit of introduction to compact quantum metric spaces. So this is a much more general framework. Uh, so what we start out with here is just um, X is a uh, a complete operator system. And Operates a system. And I will also assume that it's concrete. So this would be um, some subspace of the bounded operators on the Hilbert space. And it's going to be closed in the uh, operator norm. Closed subspace. And it satisfies two extra properties, uh, namely that uh, the unit belongs to the subspace and uh, it's closed under the adjoint operation. So if I know that X belongs to my operator system, oops, then the adjoint of X is also in there. So that's, that's a concrete, complete operator system. <laughs> and uh, such an operator system has a uh, state space. state space is of x and the elements in here they are states so this consists of of the positive linear maps you defined on this operator system and with values inside the complex numbers, and they have to map the unit to the unit. So that mu of one is equal to one. And here positive, an element is positive in here when it's positive as an operator on this Hilbert space where X is represented. That's what it means. And this state space um, becomes a compact Hausdorff space. This is a compact. Of space when you equip it with the uh, uh, weak star topology. With uh, weak star topology, what does this mean? If you have a net of states, it converges in this topology uh, when it converges pointwise. So that's the weak star topology. It's topology of pointwise convergence of these states. Um, so this is an interesting compact Hausdorff space associated with my complete operator system. And uh, I'm interested in uh, metrics on this uh, state space. And in particular, those metrics which metrize the weak star topology. Um, and there's a fundamental observation that there are plenty of metrics 
on the state space and they come from uh, semi norms on this operator system. This stands for Lipschitz. <laughs> it's not for left, because I could have just uh, right instead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so how do you get metrics on the state space from semi norms? Uh, so this is an observation. Due to Kahn and Riefel, I would say, but it's perhaps even older. Um, so if I have uh, a semi norm L, um, this will be defined on a dense uh, subspace of my operator system. So I have a semi norm, and the domain uh, it sits inside operator system and it's uh, norm dense it's a norm dense subspace norm -dense. okay and this semi norm it has to satisfy two extra properties uh, very weak properties uh, the first one is that um, well the unit should still belong to my dense subspace it should belong to the domain so one is in there and the semi norm vanishes when I apply it to one. So it, it uh, vanishes on all scalar multiples of the unit. The second one is that um, whenever I have an element inside the domain, curly X here, then um, I know that the adjoint is also in there. And uh, moreover, the semi norm doesn't see the difference between the adjoint and the element I started with. So these are your only two properties. Um, when these are satisfied, uh, I will write down a, a metric on the state space. It's called the Mohs Kontrolovich metric. it has depending on which field you're in it has another name but for me it's called the most control of its metric hmm? yes yes also yeah okay it's called row l um, and it's defined on the state space okay it's, it's almost a metric uh, it could take the value infinity, but otherwise it satisfies all the usual properties for being a metric. Um, how is it defined? Uh, the distance between two states, mu and nu. This is the supremum over a lot of absolute values. Uh, I look at the difference of my two states, mu and nu, and x has to belong to the domain of my semi norm, and when I apply the semi norm to x, it has to be dominated by one. Okay. Yes, and the main definition is that. Main definition it says that um, this pair consisting of my operator system together with my semi norm this is a compact on a metric space Okay. 
it's also called CQMS. When uh, rho L here, this most control of its metric, it metrizes the weak star topology. So that's it. Um, okay, um, examples. <laughs> examples. Uh, if you start with a compact metric space, you can construct a compact quantum metric space and you can use the most control of its metric to recover the metric that you started out with. I'm not going to go into details with this. I would rather give another example, which I've been building up to here. Um, so this is also the first theorem, theorem of this talk. Um, Says that if I look at quantum issue two, with my semi norm LQ, which took the operator norm of the left Dirac derivative of an element, then this is a compact quantum metric space. Okay, uh, one more thing. Q can be equal to one, and I'm going to say something about this case now. <laughs> so Q can be equal to one. Um, okay, for Q equals one, what happens? What happens there? Um, well, the there you use that the okay the three sphere is homomorphic to issue two. Um, so I have a map. I have an embedding actually of the uh, three sphere into the uh, state space for uh, this C style to vary quantum issue two for Q equals one, which happens to be continuous functions on issue two. Okay, so we have this embedding using this homomorphism and um, over here I can look at the round metric classical round metric so over here I have um, the round metric And over here, um, over here, I have this most controllable metric coming from my uh, semi norm when Q equals one. So this embedding here is an isometry for these two guys. Okay. So I can actually recover the round metric on the three sphere from this. Uh, left Dirac derivation. <laughs> yes, so now uh, it looks like we are um, on the right track. So we have now turned quantum issue two into a compact quantum metric space for every value of the deformation parameter Q. And we even have that for Q equals one, we get the three sphere with the classical round metric. So this is kind of nice. Um, and now we would like to understand how are these uh, combat quantum metric spaces changes when I, I vary the Q deformation parameter. And for this, I'm going, this continuity is going to be captured by the quantum form of Hausdorff distance. Yeah. That's the Dirac operator. It comes from the Dirac operator for the three sphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so it's it's it it comes from the Dirac operator on the three sphere by taking uh, commutators. So, okay, okay. So, for the three sphere, the uh, spinner bundle is uh, trivial. 
and the Dirac operator acts on um, two copies of smooth functions on issue two. So you can extend it to an unbounded operator on Hilbert space and you can take commutators. And if you do that, you get exactly this left Dirac uh, derivation. Yeah. yeah. So everything is compatible. Yeah. Okay. So what is this quantum comb of Hausdorff distance? Uh, perhaps, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the point is now to be able to measure the distance between two uh, quantum metric spaces. How do you do that? So now I look at um, I look at two compact quantum metric spaces, and then I would like to measure the distance between them. And I will look at a particular class of semi-norms. Um, so I will look at semi-norms M, which I defined on the direct sum of the uh, two domains. So the domain for L is called curly X, and the domain for K up here is called curly Y. So that's why my semi-norms are defined. And such a semi-norm is called uh, admissible. What does this mean? It means that, okay, I could look at the completions of curly X and curly Y, this direct sum, I get an operator system, which is a direct sum of my two operator systems, X and Y. Equip with this semi-norm, and this has to be a common quantum metric space. So the most control of its metric coming from this semi-norm has to metrize the weak star topology on the state space. Okay, this is one condition. It also has to be related to these two semi-norms I started out with. Um, so they have to be uh, quotient semi-norms. And L and K are quotient semi-norms. Okay, under some particular subjective maps, which are just given by the projections uh, from this direct sum and down to the two factors. I have the direct sum here, and then I have two Projections, one down to curly X and one down to curly Y. It's called pi one, and this is pi two. So L has to be the quotient semi-norm for M under this subjective map, and K has to be the quotient semi-norm for M under this other uh, map, subjective map. Okay, when I have such as an admissible semi-norm, um, it has some consequence for what happens on the uh, state spaces. This actually means that implies that I get isometric embeddings at the level of the state spaces by taking the dual maps. Um, so I get isometric embeddings. of the state space of X into the state space for the direct sum and um, also for the state space of Y into this direct sum. And I just use the dual of these two projections. And because I've assumed that they're quotient semi-norms, uh, these becomes isometries uh, at the level of state space when everything is equipped with more scatolovic metrics. They are isometric embeddings. Um, so I, I can use them now to measure the distance between these two state spaces, uh, the usual Hausdorff distance between these two state spaces when they are embedded in here. So I get the Hausdorff distance.
is a distance, cost of distance, and I'm going to use the most Cantorius metric coming from M to measure the house of distance between these two state spaces. Does this make sense? And the quantum core of house of distance between these two compact quantum metric spaces, that will be the infimum over all this kind of um, house of distances. Yeah. Okay, so definition of the quantum house of distance okay, so that would be dist q in these two on my quantum metric spaces, it will be the infimum over all these Hausdorff distances. The S of X and S of Y, where M is admissible. Okay. Such an embedding actually exists. Yeah, this I think you can construct. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's always uh, um, non empty. Yeah, yeah, it's always non empty, and uh, it's also. Uh, finite. Yeah. Yeah. So you have one of these embeddings. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. Okay. I would say the main theme about this quantum quantum of house of distance uh, now. So there's a, there's a, a theory. Um, it says that this quantum quantum of house of distance is actually a, a complete metric. Uh, this is two to three for also. This two here is a complete metric on um, isometric isomorphism classes of um, common econometric spaces on isometric. Isomorphism classes. Classes of uh, CQMS. Okay. I will put quotation marks here um, because there's a lot of research being <laughs> devoted to this. Um, Isometric isomorphism problem for econometric spaces, uh, because actually it's it's quite a subtle uh, issue, and um, so a lot of research is actually devoted to this uh, to find an improvement uh, on Riefel's quantum form of Hausdorff distance. It's mainly being driven by Frederic Latremolière that you're going to hear speaking uh, next week. Um, yeah, so here's, for example, invented the quantum core of house of propinquity, which is better adapted to a C star algebraic framework and many other things. Okay, uh, but we are currently working with this quantum core of house of distance a la Riefel. And now I can state the main theorem of this talk. Still set. A 
there's a certain map which I can now look at, uh, which is defined on the interval from zero to one where one is included, and it takes values inside from the chronometric spaces, isometric isomorphism classes of this, whatever this means, um, and uh, equipped with this quantum of house of distance. Uh, and it sends uh, Q deformation parameter into um, quantum issue two, C star algebraic quantum issue two with this semi norm uh, coming from the left Dirac derivation, and this map is continuous. So these come at quantumetric spaces based on quantum issue two, they vary continuously. Um, with respect to this quantum comb of Hausdorff distance. And for Q equal one, you get the classical free sphere. Um, and this is included in this continuity result. Yeah, how much time have I got? It's five o'clock. I, 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 will, I will say that this theorem here, it, it really took us a long time to prove it and um, in the proof, we are also using earlier results on the uh, Podlish sphere, which we obtained together with uh, Conrad Aguilar, and also um, even earlier results, um, which we obtained together with Thomas Gottfels, uh, who was a PhD student of uh, David. So there's a lot of work coming ahead of this. And even with all that work, this is still not so easy. Yeah. Okay, there's a little challenge. So I'd hope that Frederic would uh, be in the audience because it's actually a challenge for him. <laughs> so that's a little challenge. Okay, so prove a similar result. In that symbol, yes. Framework. So, e.g., or say the uh, quantum comb of Hausdorff propinquity instead of the quantum comb of Hausdorff distance. Okay, that's a little challenge, and I think I have nothing more to add to this. So, uh, thank you for listening to this talk. Do you think it will be what will be the main problems to proving it generalizing for other early groups? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to make it clear in my mind what the several problems are. Okay, so um, first of all, it's a little bit underdeveloped um, on the on the side of non-commutative geometry. So it's not clear. So I said earlier that this left direct derivation it comes from a twisted modular spectral triple. If you look at other, uh, say, Q deformed um, simple Lie algebras, then it's, it's not super clear which seminorm you should be looking at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, that, that would be super nice. Um, that would be super nice. I, so I, I currently have a, a PhD student who is working hard on, um, on tackling the quantum plane, which is like, yeah, next step 
after the Potlitz sphere. Um, yeah, but in principle, if you have a a nice guess for a semi norm, then then there's at least a concrete problem to study. Yeah. Yeah, CPQ two. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Um, it's oh, okay. There's a word of warning for this. <laughs> so, how do you I, how do you prove this kind of of uh, theorem? You have to. Um, so it's actually being built up from. You analyze a pretty small commutative uh, subalgebra, which is in this um, picture for quantum issue two, it's generated by B times B star. Okay. And, and you can see that the, there you can compute the spectrum. Uh, you get that the spectrum is uh, even powers of Q, okay, uh, in, including zero. And you can actually really use this semi norm to, you can then work a bit and you can find a concrete metric on this uh, compact Hausdorff space, uh, which gives you back the semi norm when restricted to that small sub algebra. Then you analyze that metric in details, proving a convergence result for that one. This small cumulative sub algebra converges to the unit interval. Um, happens to do so. And then you lift all this up by using some uh, extra machinery, mainly a quantum analog of the Beretzen transform. So that's how you do it. But you really need to understand first some classical space with some metric coming from this data and you can analyze that explicitly. That's how we did it. Um, so. So then, but for CP2, this should make sense because the BB star is going to be the invariance when you take the coaction on the left and on the right. Mm -hmm. So for CP2, it should be the same thing, no? And it should be commutative. Yeah. 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 This is also why this is kind of a scenario that you can study. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're currently in the process of computing the metric on this uh, compact house of space. So it's a kind of simplex that you get. Yeah. Very naive question. Does this uh, element correspond to some reducible star representation of your well, sister, corresponding sister algebra? Or... Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you have this BB star. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's a kernel, some reducible. Ah, uh, this I, 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 I'm not so sure. I, I, may, I, I mean, yeah, perhaps, perhaps I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So you have Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Together with Conrad. Ah, yeah, okay. So I proved together with Conrad first that it was a compact uh, quantum metric space, the part of the sphere. And then later on, together with Conrad and David to prove this convergence result. Yeah. But it's... So knowing that you have such a continuous map uh, that takes these CSUQ2s, which are definitely non-commutative mm -hmm. to a commutative guy, uh, do you get, uh, can you understand properties about CSUQ2 from what you know about SU2? Like, do, are there things that are that's, dragged along with this uh, map? That's a super good question. So uh, I, I think so. Uh, in my opinion, it's a little bit underdeveloped field yet. But even, I mean, 
properly understand what it means that you have distance zero is a uh, yeah quite interesting um yes yeah, so, so we actually prove other results too that there's a kind of so this is i mean it's kind of hidden in the statement but it's it's proof for I mean, this semi-norm was defined on the cornered algebra um if you change the domain of the semi-norm uh, that's also kind of Lipschitz algebra that you can work with and and we can prove that the distance between this cornered algebra and the Lipschitz algebra is is uh, zero so I think it's super interesting to kind of ask whether this implies that the k theory is isomorphic for example yeah the, the, Hmm? Now I understand why you picked up the Lipschitz algebra for Sure. <laughs> no, but I mean, so, so, so to this, to this Lipschitz algebra it always has the same K theory as the surrounding C star algebra. But it's quite interesting to know whether distance zero implies isomorphism in K theory, because then you would have polynomial generators for your K theory classes. Yeah, but I, I think it's a super interesting question. Um, so that's true for quantum issue two, um, and we know distance zero in that context. So, yeah, but I don't know how to prove that kind of stuff. So I'm, I mean, this is building on Karen's question, and more difficult, I guess. I, I asked Conrad this as well. So what you're doing here is you have a spectral triple, but you've never needed to use the compact resolvent condition. No, actually, so, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so what we have, we've had for, for these quantum plague manifolds, the irreducible ones, we have a natural Dirac operator, and it does everything except the compact resolvent, which is, as usual, a terrible thing to prove. Yeah. Uh, we conjecture that it has compact resolvent, yeah. we just can't show it. But would there be, I mean, this is a very blue skies question, but if you can prove it's a compact quantum metric space without needing the compact resolvent, then the spirit of Karen's question, might you be able to pull the uh, compact resolvent condition along and then avoid actually needing to calculate it explicitly? Hey, this, this is an interesting question. question. I, I absolutely don't know. Uh, I would, I, 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 that would be awesome, of course. Uh, but, uh, I, 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 I actually think that you can't. Um, because, so I said that these spectral triples, they were modular. Um, and it means that, except in the case for Q equals one, they, they actually don't have compact resolvent. <laughs> so, um, so you cannot do that, I think. Yeah, so you can use, there's a, a, a weight instead that you can write down and you can, use that to measure the growth of the uh, eigenvalues. So actually, okay, I can, if you're interested in these matters, well, I don't know how much, it's, yeah, you, you, you're welcome to just <laughs> skip out. <laughs> I will not be offended by this. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so you have this kind of gadget. Um, okay, so, and and DQ is a self-adjoint unbounded operator, um, and it is so that if I look at This twisted commutator, then I get exactly this partial x. Okay, if I take the closure. Okay, so that's that's how this relates to this uh, left Dirac derivation. But um, dq here, it's um, it's a little bit nasty because you 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 have to if you if you multiply it with a particular unbounded operator, which is basically K inverse, I think. So if you look at, if you multiply the K inverse and take the square, um, then you get the uh, Casimir. So, 
and the uh, Casimir, the inverse of the Casimir has, has exponential decay. Okay, but uh, if you represent it on this uh, Hilbert space, so the eigenvalues decays exponentially. But if you just look at the inverse of dq here, it's not even compact. It only becomes compact when you modify it in this fashion. And it means that you can measure, I mean, you can define a weight and then measure the, I mean, uh, rephrase this property using the weight. So that's, that's how it is. It's a, it's a little bit sad, but that's, a, that's a, the, the a case. Uh, but I, I mean, okay, this is stretching my memory too far. <laughs> it's stretching my memory too far. Uh, I, I mean, this one has explicit spectrum too, but the, the eigenspaces are infinite dimensional. Um, yeah. hmm. yeah. And this K inverse, it actually also commutes with DQ. So it's kind of nice, but it doesn't really fit with usual theory but it's perfectly valid to look at this semi-norm and it does the right thing <laughs> even now you don't have compact resolvent yeah pretty naive question am i right that uh, if you will just take as a dirac what is written in brackets so dq times q inverse then uh for this commutator you will not need the twist it will be just a commutator but so. in this unbounded I mean, okay, I, I'm just coming yeah. a bit from an algebraic point of view, mm -hmm. then it will be very nice algebraic Dirac coming yeah, from yeah, a percentage. Yeah, but, 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 but then the, the, I mean, it's kind of, uh, I mean, you can rescale it this way and look at the commutator, the straight commutator, but it's an unbounded operator, so you cannot take the operator norm. But you uh, don't have... it will still give you the same delta, no? Uh, no, scaled with K inverse. Um, but now you don't, uh, you will not need this twist. You will not need the twist, but you get an unbounded operator no. growing like K inverse. And so then you cannot take the operator norm unless you multiply with K and then you're back. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so do we have any more questions? Are there any questions online? Don't think so. So, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so that's just one specific uh, generalization of this number that you already had that one on SVN with uh, not just one parameter, but a lot of them. Ah, yeah. I mean, the one having a weight that I don't need. That, that, that's, I mean, so for values of Q that are not real, for example, is that what you're asking? Uh, I mean, that, that that could be one option. I mean, there should be some cosecular twists, I guess, of quantum SUN. I, I, it's possible. Um, I, I don't currently know because the thing is that you, you need to know also, I mean, you need to have a good spectral triple to start with. I mean, you need to have a good candidate for the semi-norm. And then you can start asking this question. Uh, but once there's a good candidate available, then it's a super interesting thing to, to look at. Um, yeah, if, if you have a larger, yeah, parameter it's space it's it's yeah i i i agree i didn't do it so yeah <laughs> there are many things uh, and there are many i mean 
I, there are uh, spectral triples which are isospectral to the classical one. But apart from that, it's uh, even for the uh, higher, for the maximum sublimate spheres, I think this is open. <laughs> what to put instead of this partial. But you could perhaps construct interesting uh, spectral triple type optics and higher uh, quantum issue, issue in, yeah. But then that's the that's question. If you take the nature of two set isospectral guys, what happens? I, I don't know. Mm. I, I haven't studied this either. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm particularly, quite a big fan of these Q deformed. No, they're, they're more natural. Also because sure. they are more linked with the quantum enveloping algebra. So I think it's, it's more interesting for that reason. They are not ruled out. They, they could in principle still be quantum metric spaces. I, I just don't know. Okay, so do we have any more questions from the audience? Maybe not, we've had quite a few. And let's check, there's nobody online. So in that case, I think we uh, thank the speaker again. So we'll talk, first of all, uh, next week's talk is again going to be a compact quantum metric space. So we have. Thank you.